everyone. Thank you for joining us. As people filter into the room, I just want to remind everyone that this will be recorded and available after the fact. So anyone who's not able to join us can, you can refer them to the recording on uh, the Pidgeup YouTube channel. Also, as we get started today, I just wanted to remind everyone that we are taking all of our questions through the Q&A feature of Zoom. So we won't be taking any voice questions from the audience just to um, make the recording more useful after the fact and to provide a little moderation. So if you have any questions during the event, um, we will be going over questions for about the last half hour. So throughout the talk, if you have questions, please put them into the Zoom Q&A box and uh, we will be doing a question and answer session at the end of the uh, panel. Thanks again, everybody. We're just going to take one more minute as people sort of filter into the room. We'll have just one minute before we get started. To those of you who are just joining us now, I wanted to let you know that we'll be taking questions through the Zoom Q&A feature and we'll be answering those questions at the end of the lecture. Good evening. I'm Christine Haight Farley. I'm a professor and a faculty director of our program on information justice and intellectual property here at American University Washington College of Law. And I want to welcome you to our ninth annual Peter Yazzie Distinguished Lecture on Intellectual Property in its first ever fully virtual iteration. We're so, we were so delighted when Suzanne Schoen Harjo accepted our invitation to give this year's lecture. And it's clear that we are not alone in thinking that what the world really needs now is to listen to Suzanne, because more than 300 of you are joining us tonight. And I wanna give you just a little sense of the good company that you're in. In addition to our wonderful students and dear alumni, we have lots of law professors in the house, or rather to be more accurate, in their own houses, um, but they are from the United States and abroad. Uh, in fact, we have attendees tonight from many countries, including Canada, Mexico, Panama, Peru, Jamaica, the UK, the Netherlands, Belgium, Switzerland, Germany, Finland, Kenya, Nigeria, South Africa, Australia, Hong Kong, the Philippines, and India. So we are delighted um, with this turnout for tonight's lecture. Um, we have, in addition to lawyers and law students and professors um, and public advocacy um, advocates, we have folks who work in the museums and the libraries across the country. We have representatives from WIPO, the WTO, South Center, the USPTO, and the Copyright Office, including Shira Perlmutter, uh, who I want to especially uh, uh, acknowledge, um, as, she as it was recently announced that she will be our next U.S. Register of Copyrights. We're also joined by the Director of the Indian Arts and Crafts Board, the Executive Director of the Native American Rights Fund, and I want to make a special shout out to a, a few folks, including Judge Judith Bartnoff, A.C. Agoyo of Indians.com, Aviva Kempner, the filmmaker who is working to tell the story of Suzanne's work, and Steve Baird, the trademark lawyer who first approached Suzanne about challenging the Washington football team's trademark so many years ago. And although none of us are in the law school at the moment, we want to take this opportunity to respectfully acknowledge that our law school is built on the traditional lands of the Nakuchnetank people. And now I'll turn over the mic, or rather uh, the unmuted greenlit square, to my colleague who we revere so much, we named this lecture after him. So please, Peter Yazzi, will you come on board? Thank you so much, Christine. It's, 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 it's always a, a, a bit of an embarrassment to to help to open these lectures, 
but by the same token, it has been over years an, an enormous opportunity for me to say hello, actually, and now virtually, at Bishop and at WCL to some of the figures who I have ad admired most over the course of my career. And, and one of those people is Suzanne Schoenharjo. Her ancestry is Cheyenne and Hodoki Muskogee. She's a citizen of the Cheyenne and Arapaho tribes. To us at Pidgeup, she's a, a treasured friend and comrade at arms. And to the rest of the world, she is probably best known as an indefatigable and resourceful champion for Native peoples. Now, it's conventional in making introductions of this kind to say that the guest has too many honors and distinctions to list. In this case, it, it's literally true. So I'm in a moment, I'm going to talk about some of those honors and distinctions, only, albeit only selectively. But there is one thing about Suzanne in the context of this lecture series that I need to acknowledge, whether it's an honor or not, is, is a, is a, is a point of perspective. She's the first non-lawyer to address this assemblage in the history of the lecture series. And as I'll explain in a moment, there are, are good reasons for that. But first, I have to give you some sense of Suzanne's career. And I think maybe at this point, I should simply rely on the highest available authority and, and read you the citation from the 2014 Presidential Medal of Freedom that was bestowed on her by Barack Obama. It went as follows. Suzanne Harjo is a writer, curator, and activist who has advocated for improving the lives of Native peoples throughout her career. As a member of the Carter administration, and as a current president of the Morning Star Institute, she has been a key figure in many important Indian legislative battles, including the passage of the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, NAGPRA, and the American Indian Religious Freedom Act. In other words, Suzanne Harjo may not be a lawyer, but she has been the moving cause between a, behind a number of extremely significant legal developments and initiatives. And I'd be remiss at this point in failing to mention also her roles as a leader of the National Congress of American Indians and in the creation of one of our cities and our country's unique cultural institutions, the Smithsonian National Museum of the American Indian. As a planner, as a founding trustee, and as the director of its influential Native Languages Archives Repository Program. Right now, at the museum, you can see an exhibit of which Suzanne Harjo was the creator and curator. It's called Nation to Nation Treaties Between the United States and American Indians, in it, between the United States and American Indian Nations, and it is by terms turns deeply informative, astonishingly beautiful, and profoundly provocative. It, it literally embodies the concept of Native American sovereignty. It runs through next year, and anyone who hasn't visited it should do so either now or later. Um, it's beautifully represented online as well, but nothing except a visit can do it justice because the artifacts that Suzanne curated for it are so striking and, and unexpected. So with that, I have now to grasp the nettle and address another question that may be on some of your minds, which is what do Suzanne Harjo's wide-ranging interests and numerous accomplishments have to do with intellectual property, which is the nominal unifying theme of this lecture series. The, the superficial theme and the superficial answer, of course, is one to which Christine has already referred. It would be to point to her role 
as a leader in the decades-long legal battle against federal recognition for the happily now defunct trademark of the Washington football team. And we'll be hearing more about that tonight. More broadly, though, for those of us at PIDGIP, there's another, I think, more profound answer. Encoded in the name of our program is, is, a, is the phrase, which we originally stole from Peter Drajos, information justice, the program on intellectual property and information justice. And it's our shared belief that getting IP right is part of a larger effort to assure that all intangible knowledge is regulated with the interests of society at large and those of its constituent elements in mind. And that includes, although it's not limited to, issues relating to minority rights and representation. Tonight, Suzanne is gonna talk about the struggle to promote information justice in relation to names and places with special significance to Native Americans. So it's a, a special honor to welcome Suzanne Harjo to virtual WCUCL, just as he, she has been welcome to many bricks and mortar academic institutions over the years. There's a, a reason for that too. At bottom, in every role she has inhabited during her distinguished career, Suzanne Harjo has proved herself to be a master teacher with a compelling approach to storytelling. We'll all have the opportunity to learn from her tonight. And in addition, we have a special treat in store, which is a, a curated collection of slides of, of people, locations, and things that she has chosen to accompany her talk. So with that and with, with tremendous gratitude, I want to welcome Suzanne Harjo and turn the podium, the virtual podium, over to her. Thank you, Suzanne, for doing us this honor. Thank you so much, Peter. I'm deeply honored to be a speaker in this program that carries your distinguished name. And I'm so happy to be back at, if only virtually, American University and the Washington College of Law. I'm indebted to professors Carol, Farley, Jazzy, and Phillips, and many more and their former students who have been instrumental in much of my work over several decades in both the fight to get rid of the terrible racial slurs and cultural appropriations in American sports and the advertising worlds, especially the research that was done that was so phenomenal about the first four major schools to eliminate their so-called Indian mascots. And those were, for those who don't know, um, the University of Oklahoma, which was the first, got rid of its little red mascot. You know, the University of Oklahoma is big red. And to start off, the schools had only colors. They didn't have any mascots. They had only colors. And they were the red or the cherry or the white or the blue and uh, or a combination of both. And they... Uh, used a, a, a diminutive version of their 
bigness, their largeness, to have portrayed either a static persona or a pers an actual person who portrayed mostly very badly native people or behaviors or appearances. And one of the worst was Little Red, Big Red's diminutive dancing mascot, which the native students called the dancing idiot. And for some reason, the fans loved, just really loved Little Red until there was a constant uproar in the 60s to get rid of Little Red, um, mainly led by Clyde Warrior, who was a Ponca dancer and orator and activist, who was a founder of Oklahoman, Oklahomans for Indian Youth. And out of that grew the National Indian Youth Council, and he was a founder of that. And he's the person who energized me and uh, informed me um, along with many others, but me in particular, when, he when I was a senior in high school at, uh, in Oklahoma City. And he came and spoke to us and he talked about student rights, about voting rights, about what we could do about things, especially closing down the remnants of the boarding schools that were uh, still doing great damage to our people. And he really focused on Little Red at the University of Oklahoma and why that was so offensive. And then he focused also on what he called the worst one. And that was the one in Washington, D.C., which he made sound as if the whole team were under the Capitol Dome calling us names so that we were being bullied from the most protected places in Washington. And that's how I felt for a very long time, even after I moved out of Oklahoma and began to understand that what I took as, uh, what someone used as an image, I was taking as literal truth and that it wasn't quite as bad as I had thought. And then to discover it was far worse. And that was when I watched what this kind of mascotting, cartooning, lampooning was doing to my children growing up in Washington, DC with the constant bombardment of the negative imaging, the name calling, the bullying, uh, the nastiness, the um, thuggery that goes along with, or went along with, I have to be optimistic here that it won't continue to under the new identity, uh, that targeted anyone who was seen as being native or, and we were not targeted in a friendly way. I'm sure people meant well. My husband and I were given free tickets and went to a game when we first moved here at the end of 1974. And we um, didn't stay for the game. We, we left beforehand because people were touching us and touching our hair uh, they, they weren't trying to harm us, but they were laying their hands on us and, and uh, asking us uh, insane kinds of inane questions. And um, it would never occur to me to say, to go up and, and start petting someone's hair and saying, oh, you have the nicest white man hair uh, what you are a white man, aren't you? Um, I knew a white man one time. It, it, it's a very strange feeling to be that objectified 
and that dehumanized. But when you deal with this realm of, of issues, it, it is exactly that. You, you're dealing with something that has no humanity to it, that has no mind, that has no heart or soul, and you will be honored or you will be ostracized. You will be al allow everyone to admire you in an objectifying way or you will be trashed. Uh, the Washington team had paid fans, paid thugs, paid people who stalked us, who went through our garbage. Of course, the, the standard investigators, the private eyes, and um, we'd been warned about much of it, but we hadn't been warned about the intensity and about the ad hoc stuff. No one could have really predicted that. And I am still to this day receiving every now and again a death threat or so about the Washington football team's former name. Now, those of us who chose to sue the team owners in 1992 have been calling it the Washington football team for so long because we just didn't, at one point we said, we just can't say this name anymore. It's so offensive and so vile that um, we're just not going to say it. And so we only called it the Washington football team. Uh, we had called it the Washington professional football team, but then we heard a, a former uh, late show talk host, uh, talk show host, tell a joke that was um, saying, have you heard the latest? Uh, the Washington professional football team has decided to change its name. It will no longer be known as professional. <laughs> and it was going, the team was going through a bad patch and, and uh, we were sorry for that uh, because we didn't want the team to lose all the time. Uh, but after a while, we did notice that we had sued them just a few months after they had gone to their last Super Bowl in 1992 for the 91 season. And I do mean their last Super Bowl because to this date, they have never returned to a Super Bowl. And we kept saying every five years or so, um, there's a lot of karma here. There's a big coincidence that there's a, we have another 15 years or so of um, the team going without a victory, never getting into the playoffs, never succeeding. Everything would be going along fine and then they just didn't do well. And every so often you would hear from one of the players a, a question that sounded like a call to, to, uh, for help <laughs> saying, I don't know what's wrong with us. We're playing our best. We have good people. We, uh, we know what we're doing. I don't know if it's the name or what, but that's exactly what we were saying is that it's karma. That this, if you look around and say, we've changed owners, we've changed coaches, we've changed players, we've changed helmets, we've changed logos, we've changed jackets, we've changed every single thing the cheerleaders, the, the band, the, the fight song, we have changed every single thing. There's only one thing we haven't changed, and that's the name. And we would say, well, exactly. And um, 
we're just still counting. So from 1992 to the present time, there has not been a Super Bowl return. Now, when we were in the stands and being objectified in the way we were to such an extent that we just had to leave, it was far too creepy. And I don't think that that's any better than the anonymous death threats that we were getting um, over the telephone and, and through other methods. It, it's, um, I don't know what in other people's common experience uh, you have this, but uh, women will certainly know it and, and very, very, very handsome young men will know this uh, because most women and very good looking men are objectified in that same kind of way. Uh, in the recent troubles that the Washington women, Washington professional football team, front office women have had uh, with the men in the front office, I, I have to say that they're experiencing the same kind of bullying that we were experience, experiencing as a racial matter, but also a, as a gender matter, because the lead plaintiffs in both our, uh, the cases that covered 25 years uh, were, were women, myself um, in the Harjo et al. versus Pro Football Inc. lawsuit, which went from 2009 to 2007, uh, I'm sorry, 1992 to 2009, and the uh, Black Horse case, which was filed in 2006, but was not active until 2010, and then went to uh, 2017. So for those 25 years, the, the target number one were uh, two women, uh, myself and Amanda Black Horse. So, I wish the women in the front office at the franchise in Washington luck and good fortune and courage to stand your ground and to take a lesson from us that if you just persist long enough even if it appears that you're not winning the day, eventually you'll win the day because um, uh, karma does work. What, what I have done over the most of my working life as a teenager and as an adult is, um, are two things. One is uh, on this issue of mascotting and cartooning and and the lampooning side of it, the cartooning side of it in the advertising world uh, to, to fight against negative imaging and the corruption of our symbology, of our iconography, and in many cases, the desecration of our cultural objects. The other thing is the protection of against desecration, against damage of our cultural rights. Anything from protection of ancestors so that people didn't feel they were entitled to just dig up grandma anytime they wanted and um, take whatever precious items she'd been buried with and use them for their own purposes or sell them or export them um, or put up big signs uh, like used to be all around the country saying, next turn two miles 
North Indian mummy or shrunken head, an Indian shrunken head, uh, Indian bones. And this was the kind of thing we were fighting on, uh, uh, trying to recover, trying to find out first where our dead relatives were, trying to recover them, trying to rebury them, trying to rebury those things that were their possessions after all. Uh, they belonged to the deceased. Those things they had been buried with that didn't belong to anyone. So that fight was the same fight as the mascotting fight. They're both brought about by disrespect and they're both sought as the goal of, of, of the search for, for dignity. Uh, and what, what they have in common is the same kind of objectification, the same kind of dehumanization, the same kind of discrimination, um, the same kind of judgmentalness. Um, when, I mean, I can't imagine going into a town or a state or another country and telling the people, just point out where your graveyard is. I want to dig up some people here <laughs> and we have a right to this. And uh, uh, whether or not they have a piece of paper that says they do, uh, feeling that they have the manifest destiny to do that it is um, pretty stunning to me. And that is at the basis of all of the issues that ha that we collectively native people and friends have have dealt with over the many decades since the 60s in trying to eliminate the name calling and in trying to protect our peoples and our our places uh, against well, everything, thievery, confiscation, uh, destruction by mining, uh, and pick a mineral, gold, and um, all of these places were taken from Native peoples in various ways, but all with the assumption of white superiority. And when you have that kind of approach, then anything is possible. You can make up any kind of law, you can make up any kind of rule or regulation, and that's exactly what was done to us. We had 60 years, uh, 50 intense years under the civilization regulations, which outlawed everything for us. Uh, ceremonies, uh, it, it made a criminal offense, parents or a medicine man, uh, interfering with the orderly, progressive nature of education for the children. My word, uh, that meant as they were being carted off to federal boarding school, or to a mission school uh, to be deculturalized and civilized by being taught a Christian only, English only curriculum. And they would be in effect tortured on day one upon arrival by having their hair shorn, um, heads dou doused in kerosene, um, everything they were wearing taken away from them, including 
medicine pouches. These are, are things that did not happen in the abstract. These happened, my mother's grandparents were in the first hostage class. They were the first hostage students in 1879 at Carlisle Industrial Indian School, which was on the war college grounds of the army in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. And they are, those kids were, were subjected to corporal punishment. They were beaten if they spoke their language. They were um, uh, beaten if they didn't speak English fast enough and on and on and on. This is not an abstraction. It's something that happened to people we know or our parents knew or our grandparents knew and knew really well. Um, my own father uh, never turned his back on his language, but he was beaten up as a nine-year-old at Uchi Indian School in Oklahoma, uh, beaten so badly for speaking his language that even though he went on to be a linguist and a cryptographer in the army, uh, made up codes and decoded messages. And so not only was he a, a code talker during World War II, but went on to become a, a cryptographer after that. And it, he spoke these other language fluently. The only one he stuttered in was the Muscogee language, the one that he was beaten for saying, for speaking when all he was saying was, let's go eat boy, or are you hungry? Or, and the, the proper things that you would say in the lunchroom uh, would get you beaten up. So in addition to being subjected to these um, indignities and lack of respect and tortures, and make no mistake, and when you take a generation or even part of a generation or even part of a population of children from their families. That's genocide. And even if not everyone dies, it's not attempted genocide, it is genocide. And you don't have to take my word for that. Take a look at the United Nations categories of genocide. And I think it will be very instructive for you these are the kinds of things that, that a lot of us have as, as just part of our armor, that we understand where we have been, what has been done to us, and that it might come again. And so we always want to, while remaining ever optimistic, that things will get better, could get better, might get better. We know how terribly wrong they can go in, in, with the wrong people in charge and the right people doing nothing and saying nothing. Uh, so you find a lot of Native people who are frontline vote getters right now uh, working very intensely uh, so that we don't have this kind of civilization situation put on us again um, just by a continuation of the current leadership. What's at the bottom of the pernicious attacks on us is this view that we are not human, we've never quite been human, and if we were human, we aren't any more because there are so few of us, or we're somehow anomalous in the modern era. And anything that we once had that was sacred or important or significant, or that we believed in, or a way, something we exercised, a ceremony we exercised, that all of that's in the past tense. Uh,
it, it's a it's a very curious thing that the people who lost the battle of killing us all are now in the in the position of judging whether we are sufficiently alive to regain the properties that we lost while they thought we were dead. So what you're having at play in, in the, this time of reckoning for, for racial and social justice with the Washington football team, for example, is money talking. Yes, we've had years of explaining, of being polite, of going through orderly processes, court cases and the like, and endless discussions. But in the end, it was money talking. And the decision that this was one of the lesser offenses that they could deal with right now. And perhaps wouldn't have to deal with the bigger things, uh, the more important things, the things they weren't about to do, which is equalize salaries to um, give people health benefits. Um, it, so the easier thing was to change the name of the, of the football team. That, I'm glad that it was one of the things that, that white supremacy chose for us. But I understand how it was done and why. And I feel like I'm evidence of the need not to accept only that and that that's only a start and not even a down payment. The white supremacy voice is the one that says you black players are slaves we bought you we owned you stay bought stay owned stay quiet that's what the very complicated collective bargaining agreement is about that doesn't even allow them to voice an opinion, the players to voice an opinion about what they think of the name they're playing under. Uh, and that was true for the whole length of our, our lawsuit. Uh, they would get fined or somehow chastised. And very few would speak up ever. It's white supremacy talking to the native people saying, you're dead, we killed you play dead, stay dead. And when we are alive, that's almost seen as an affront. So, and we're treated as criminals, even though we're the ones in those orderly processes, such as court cases. And there's nothing more orderly than that. Uh, when in fact, orderly to the point of being boring. <laughs> um, it is, and the same goes for these really lengthy court cases dealing with our, with protection of our lands and our waters. You have some water protection cases that have been going on for five decades some land protection cases that have been going on for several decades and promise to to go on to more. What we need is some tweaking of laws. We have some good laws that that we're working with that, that have served us well on repatriation, the return from repositories, uh, museums, federal agencies, educational institutions, and other collectors of our relatives, human remains, funerary objects, sacred items, and 
cultural patrimony. And cultural patrimony gets to the point where I think we need to go in the law next. And, and that is, where the declaration of what is sacred and what is important and what is necessary and needed is up to the declaration of the people who hold it sacred and not up to the judgment of the bureaucrat or a judge or anyone else outside that body who would review it or examine that declaration to see how sound it is. We won some very important fights in developing the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. And one was against the art world that simply thought they could get away with grave robbing and stealing items from from our churches, from our sacred places, by auctioning them and thereby desanctifying them or desacrifying them, which is an interesting bit of fiction because that's not how sacredness works in anyone's religion the world over. Uh, our, the, the, we're constantly being asked to define everything and to reveal everything about a certain place or to reveal everything about a certain ceremony. No one else is expected to do that. No, no one else's religion it has the burden of proving that these things are important that these things have been done continuously, that this is our belief, and not only is it our belief, it is a belief that we exercise. The, the notion that you can have a belief, but not the exercise of a belief is something that people have layered into decisions in courts about our ability to get into court and stay into court and protect our sacred places. The idea being that we can only believe while other people, uh, non-native people, have churches, do not have to say what the purpose of the church is, do not have to talk about how a ceremony or a service is done, do not have to say which is the central thing or even have a central thing. It, do not have to give any detail about the thing. All they have to say is, this is our church and we'll let you know if we want anything besides a tax break. And the public lands have churches, uh, uh, Judeo-Christian churches and non-denominational, meaning usually Judeo-Christian churches, um, chapels on every national park in the country and on many state parks. Those are financed by the taxpayers. We're paying for everyone, Native people are paying for everyone else's religious structures that they've made, but they've made them in part on top of our sacred places or to the side of them, or they're drawing water from them so the medicine plants do not derive the benefit of springs that once sprang before the water table was lowered by 300,000 bikers in Sturgis, South Dakota, which is just a stone's throw literally from Bear Butte, which the Cheyennes call Holy Mountain, Noos, Noos, that's Holy Mountain. That should tell you the importance of that. And after hearing that, and after hearing the same level of importance expressed by Arapahoes and by Lakotas and Kiowas and others who revere 
that place and and approach it with reverence and have it as part of their traditions as well it's no one else's business our people our ancestors tried to warn general george armstrong custer about this um, about the customs we have of leaving your weapons at the bottom uh, and not going up this small mountain, a volcano that pushed up but didn't explode, and never taking a weapon except the, you know, a small knife or whatever you needed to uh, take care of yourself or be able to um, do what you needed to do uh, for food or, or drink if, if you were uh, going to be there a couple of days of vision questing or, or a rite of passage of some type. And Custer just laughed at the whole thing and, and spurred his horse to go up as far as it could while he waved his sword around, just being so disrespectful to the ways of the people as they were being explained and described so clearly and in the context of a treaty of peace and friendship with the United States and all of the many nations who hold Holy Mountain holy. So we're trying to preserve trying to stop the uh, water table from being lowered in Sturgis, trying to stop the people from taking the water away from the trees, taking the water away from the migratory birds who stop there, uh, there are eagles who stop there, red-tailed hawks, there are kit foxes who stop there, Lots of animals stop there, including the human animals. And having the water table lowered by the development around Holy Mountain and by just conspicuous consumption has already dried up a lake and is really in danger right now of drying up the the freshwater springs. So we need to look at the kinds of legislation that would make sense for us after many years of having some basic policies articulated in the American Indian Religious Freedom Act and some ideas questioned about the sacred for us in court cases, we need to look at ways to protect these places as the Religious Freedom Act declares that it's the policy of the United States to preserve and protect the original um, traditional religions of native peoples. We can do that many ways. Uh, one way is to uh, to do it by an amendment. We've already amended the Religious Freedom Act um, to protect the use of peyote as a sacrament by Native American church members. And there's a, a way of looking at, I mean, Congress has, a, has an easy way of looking through its oversight responsibility at the years of doing a certain kind of thing under a certain law and has it worked, has it been beneficial? Uh, if not, why not? If so, how? And what can we replicate? Uh, we can do that with the Religious Freedom Act. We could also do an executive order uh, that would take a look at where the president would direct the federal agencies to 
work with Native peoples to identify those sacred places within their jurisdiction and to answer a question, were these taken, were they acquired with the free prior and informed consent of the people, of the Native peoples? That's what the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples recommends. It says return, recommends that all the states, all the countries, return those sacred places that were not taken with the free prior and informed consent of the people. So under an executive order, the agencies and, and native peoples would, would look at a place and try to figure out what the remedy would be. How do you protect it from this point going on is it through outright transfer of ownership? Uh, would it be through co-management? There are many co-management agreements. There are also many transfers, uh, many conveyances, uh, more, far more than, than I think people realize. Uh, a joint stewardship agreement, and there are also many of those existing now and have existed for decades. Uh, or through other kinds of protections. And uh, so an executive order would take you right up to the point of doing that, and then would be able to have everyone take the next step, which is now do that, either make that transfer or uh, if you feel you need congressional help then uh, go for jointly proposed um, piece of legislation. So that those are uh, some ways that we could uh, work with that, with just ERFA and just the existing executive order on sacred sites. For the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, we need stiffer penalties. Uh, the law enforcement people say we just didn't write it well enough to, um, for them to be able to nab the bad guys. And so you have a lot of underground uh, illegal trafficking going on, but it's not prosecutable. And so that has to be done. And there, there needs to be, um, a lot of things need to be looked at. And there again, Congress has a way of saying the, the NAGPRA became law in 1990. It's a long time ago now. In that time, how have the repatriations gone? Have, are they satisfactory? Have they gotten the job done? Because the whole point is, the, it had a twofold point. One was to protect the ancestors and burial grounds, and two, to return those who have been displaced already. So that kind of tinkering with that law uh, is certainly in order, and we can learn much from uh, the people who have made repatriations, uh, who have completed them, and to call on the carpet those re holding repositories that haven't done anything, not even their inventories, which should have been done in the 90s, to date. So a good congressional oversight look at compliance is definitely in order and to ask the people who are the most directly involved and those are the people from the native nations and the people from the holding repositories asking them what is it that you would have done differently what was and and you detect a pattern almost immediately 
uh, from the first few witnesses. Uh, that sort of thing is um, just a, a perfect example of the way that, that if you were teaching it in a civics class, and I know no one knows what a civics class is anymore because they've gone the way of the dinosaurs, but they were good things, which told us how government is supposed to work. Um, this would be a, a good example, a good model for the way government is meant to work, that you base new laws or changed laws on the effectiveness of the laws already in place or the ineffectiveness uh, because there are no laws in place or of the laws in place. There are thousands of things that, that could be done. Everyone has their own notions about what they might be and there are people busily uh, working about on, on this kind of thing and trying to trying to stop the tremendous underground activity that that currently exists in our ancestors and in our sacred objects pretty soon on the on the Mascotting side, we have a lot of work to do. We've only eliminated two thirds of these native references in sports. And we have a lot to eliminate in the advertising world. I'm happy that um, Squaw Valley is finally admitting that that's a vile and pejorative word and that we don't want to be called that and that they shouldn't have a place named it. That happened in Arizona with Paestewa Peak, which is named after the first woman who was killed in the Iraq war Lori Paestua, a Hopi and Navajo woman, soldier. It was called Squaw Peak, and we've been trying to get it changed for years, and then the governor of Arizona, a woman, Janet Napolitano, said, I get it, let's change it. What do you want it to be changed to? And everyone agreed that it would be a fine thing to name it in honor of an actual woman who's an actual hero. And so Paestua Peak stands. That's been eliminated from almost every sports entity, including some very prestigious ones that people have forgotten about now, and that's good. But the place names we need to address. So Native people are always accused of having an, a, a hidden agenda. We don't have a hidden agenda. We have a right out in the open agenda, land back, water back, people back, names back. Uh, stop calling us, um, calling our, our sacred places by the names of people who massacred Native people. We, we got rid of one of those. Uh, just a few years ago, which is now called Black Elk Peak. And you, from Black Elk Peak, formerly the name of a, of a, a soldier who, who wiped out almost an entire village of Lakota people, You can see the sacred Black Hills from that peak, and it's a view that is like no other anywhere. 
it's an amazing thing. And it's no wonder that the famous visionary Black Elk was able to have the visions he had with such a view. Not only a spiritual view, but a physical view that is absolutely awe-inspiring. So, pretty simple. Our unfinished agenda is not hidden. Once again, land back, water back, people back, names back. We could talk about almost any area of Native life and make the same analysis and the same correlation between them and as I've been making between the mascotting issue and the offenses to our places and to our religions. Certainly that damaging situation of our missing and murdered indigenous women and girls and boys has as at its root disrespect, dehumanization, objectification. There are reasons people think we have no value and it's because everything about us is commodified and we have no way of being a part of that commodification. We have no way of protecting against a gold mine. We are the, ours are the only religions that can't use the constitution to get into court, just as a bare cause of action can't use the first amendment to get into court. Everyone else can use those. Ours are the only religions Native people's religions in our countries on this land that no one added to when they came here. Not a single person brought any land with them. And out of that land, out of our waters, grew our laws, the treaties that we made with the United States and prior to them with European countries and that we still keep today. I think what we ask for is pretty modest And that people should, especially at this time of understanding more about justice and injustice and how it operates and how long it operates and how hard it is to change it. should really work with us as in move out of the way and help us accomplish what we need to have accomplished in order to gain the restorative justice we need for ourselves and our coming generations. So I thank you all for inviting me here for encouraging me, for helping me in, in the work I do, and for doing what you can to help us think through the details of what will be needed over the coming years. 
when everyone is so impatient and so determined not to let any more time pass be, it, before some measures of justice are attained in our lifetime on our watch. So thank you to everyone who wants to be a part of that. Um, we'll see you on the long road for everyone else. Aho. Thank you so much, Suzanne. Um, I'm uh, Michael Carroll. I'm, I'm Christine Farley's co-director of the program on information justice and intellectual property. And that was, that was very powerful. And you've given us so much to think about. Um, my role here is to moderate a, a question and answer session. Um, and I, I, there are a couple of questions in the, um, in the Q and A chat. And if there are other people who want to go ahead and post those, I will pose them uh, to Suzanne. Um, that was that was really quite quite a lot to take in, and I appreciate it so much. Um, the first hand up, though, is uh, uh, Peter Yazdi, who uh, has a question for you, and I'm going to call on him. I'll be reading other folks' questions, but at least within uh, those of us in the Pidget family, I'm going to let Peter speak for himself. So, <laughs> Peter, could you please? Uh, what's your question? I, I can and will and 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 we'll begin again by by thanking Suzanne for an for an extraordinary and 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 deeply deeply not only deep thought provoking but 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 emotionally powerful presentation. I I wanted to ask another question about. Um, agenda items, things to work on. Um, in, in, in the end, as we know, the, the long struggle that, that you began and, and led around the federal recognition of the name of the Washington football team had a, a good practical result. But the result in terms of, of trademark doctrine was not quite as, as straightforwardly positive as the behavior under, under extreme pressure of, of the team itself. And indeed, the, the, and despite all the, the, the best efforts of, of, WCL alum, Judge Gerald Lee, we ended up finally not in the, not in this case, but in the, in the, in the TAM case with a, a, a very much reduced, if not, if not uh, shredded form of the trademark disparagement doctrine. And I, I wonder whether you have any thoughts about what let me let me just make make the further point that the the issue that you raised in that case the fundamental issue that you raised in that case the case about why the, the question as to what possible justification there is for the federal government through its own action to add strength and currency to trademarks that offend groups and individuals who do not themselves wish to, to embrace that offense. It seems to me that that is still a tremendously important cause. And I wonder if you have any thoughts about what we all collectively could or should be doing to try to pursue that that part of your your original agenda thank you that's that's um 
Well, for over 2,000 changes that have been made in um, mostly in educational sports, there's really only been a handful, literally a handful, um, four or five lawsuits involved. The rest of them were done without any litigation at all. So, and could be done with, um, in the same way. So the, the best way to change something is to change it. And that's probably the approach that most Native people will be working on to try to get these others um, to uh, other schools, other pro teams, to follow the lead of the Washington football team and get rid of its its racist stereotypes and its um, cultural appropriations. So that's one approach. Just keep on doing the things we're doing and everyone just chime in and, and help. I have noticed that with great bravado, the, the Blackhawks PR people uh, put out a press release that they had filed their trademark uh, renewal and so sue us if you want, knowing full well that no one can because as a result of, of um, the Washington football team's coattail victory on the back of the slants case. Uh, when, when we first find, and, and for those who don't know, the, the, um, Simon Tam wanted a, uh, he was the leader of the, is the leader of a band, um, I guess it's still a band called the slants an Asian band, um, and if we had known about them, they weren't around at the time, we probably would have used them as an example rather than NWA in our first press conference about our lawsuit on September 10, 1992, when we uh, took questions and, and we were asked if this was a First Amendment um, freedom of speech case. And we said, no, it's not that we want, that we want to continue this uh, or that we want a part of it or we want our own trademark of the same disparaging names. Far from it. We, we're not even saying that the Washington team has to stop. That's not what this lawsuit is about. This lawsuit is saying the team owners can call their team any old racist name they want, and they do, and they did. What we were saying is the federal government should not endorse that racism especially by the gift of exclusivity and a private right to make money solely off that racism. And what we were banking on is that the Washington team owners who were not involved in an altruistic enterprise would drop the name if there were no federal protection for it, trademark protection. And we did use the example of the band NWA, saying that's a good example of, of something that the law protects. And it should, because that's the expression of the people 
from the inside out, no matter how offensive it might be to some, and some within that same group of people. That is free speech. What we're talking about eliminating is the bullying, the aggravated assault speech, the hateful speech, that kind of outside, inside name calling. And that's what the Lanham Act of the Trademark Act provided. It provided for a, a process for that and for the agency to the trademark agency and board and judges to make determinations. Now, not about cancellation. Ours was the first cancellation suit, uh, which was the genius of, of our friend Steve Baird uh, saying, well, this is the process for approval of of these kinds of marks, uh, registrations. So let's let's see if it will work in reverse. And there was an admission by the uh, trademark judges that uh, yes, that need these marks are canceled, pending appeal, of course, and should never have been approved in the first place. So. while we were litigating, we also were legislating, trying to legislate, and uh, a wonderful lawyer named Paul Moorhead uh, did a draft of a bill called the Non-Discrimination uh, Against Native Persons and Peoples uh, Act, and then we tweaked that rewrote it, uh, the two main sponsors uh, and myself, uh, Eni Falio Mavega from American Samoa and John Lewis um, of Georgia to make it much clearer what we were talking about and that we weren't talking about an actual trademark, we were talking about the offense and and what to do about it. So it was a, a reinforcement of the Lanham Act. And um, that is a piece of legislation that bears looking at again and either tossing out in whole or, or uh, um, readjusting it, redrafting it so that it makes sense in the context of the litigation that has just happened in the TAM case. So those are my only ideas. I, uh, but I'm just one person in a very long movement. Uh, uh, the No Mascots movement is long and strong and has lots of moving parts. Uh, otherwise, it would be a, a click or, or a club or an organization, and it's not. It's a movement. So there are lots of people applying themselves to this right now, and it, and it will be, um, there'll be a lot of good ideas that emerge. And I would be happy to work with anyone who wants to um, look at any of these approaches that I've discussed. Thanks, thanks so much, Suzanne. There, we actually have quite a few questions and I'm gonna try to uh, organize this a little bit to maybe take uh, deal with some of the what I hope are the quicker ones. I think all of these questions raise multiple issues, um, and so. Uh, <laughs> but what one a lot of these questions are about language and names, um, and one is is a very practical question that goes sort of to the heart of the racial awakening that's happening more broadly in the U.S. But but for non-native peoples, in terms of using language appropriately, the the question goes to um, is is from a someone who was in a student uh, who had uh, referred to native people as quote unquote American Indians, and was corrected to now say Native Americans. And just as a pure you know educational moment, can you for for non-native people in the audience, and there are a lot of people around the world. 
what what is the proper use of language to describe Native peoples? Okay, American Indian, Native American, they're both wrong, so use them interchangeably. Um, since the Indigenous Peoples um, Declaration from the UN, uh, the term Indigenous Peoples has gained some greater respect than it had. Um, we're less concerned with our collective name, which is just for the convenience of people, not us, than with the restoration and reclamation of our traditional personal names, of our people's names, um, protection and, and revitalization of our languages, uh, of, which includes all terminology, and our protocols of diplomacy amongst each other. How do we behave toward each other and how do we express that? That was turned on its ear in the, in the mission schools and the federal boarding schools where one way of controlling our ancestors was to set them on each other and to um, make j jokes about um, cutting remarks about other people's ways, other people's religions, other people's, it was a way of detribalizing and deculturalizing the people. And um, that has, has worked uh, in, sadly, uh, probably beyond their wildest dreams. And they only had the unifying Indian or native or warrior or brave as a way of also detribalizing through pan Indianism. Um, so, you know, this, it, it, it's a, it's not a complicated issue, but it has a lot of nuance to it. And the main thing is to get the person's name right. And how do you do that? What is your name? <laughs> uh, kids on the playground know that. Wh what's your name? Where, where do you live? Where do you come from? Who are you? Everyone wants to establish kinship. Who are your people? How, how do we know each other? How, how can we know each other? How can we behave toward each other? Uh, how can you help me? How can, you, how can I keep you from hurting me? <laughs> <laughs> there are all sorts of uh, things that you establish very quickly as a child uh, that we sort of tiptoe around as adults. And the very last thing that, that is of any importance is how do we call everyone who's like you? Mm -hmm. That's not a question that gets asked. It's, it, it's, um, it's sort of a who cares question or we'll let you know when we get to it. Um, or just call us the thing that the last person you asked told you to say. <laughs> <Just> okay. <laughs> um, well, thanks for that. And I, I recognize, as you say, it's the collective has been so imposed. And what do you do with an imposed collective? Um, uh, one other question that I, I also think is probably not as simple as it sounds, but but it goes to this spirit of allyship that is running through a lot of the questions. So in the same way that it's, you know, appropriate, respectful use of language, um, in terms of the agenda, what are the sacred places that are most at risk? Right now. Every single one of them right now, because of actions taken by this administration that have, have opened up through regulatory change or removing regulations that govern environmental protection, that govern water control, water protection, uh, 
safe drinking water even, uh, that approve pipelines and sludge running under water sources, sometimes the only water source for an entire region. Um, the wholesale drilling that's being opened up right now, even in places that are supposed to be protected places, Chaco Canyon, uh, Bears Ears, the, these are already protected places, supposedly, yet the, the new black gold rush is so feverish right now that it's almost a madness. And I think we're going to have a very hard time keeping up with all of the damage that has been done already and even learning about it. Uh, many people have many, many Native peoples have many lawsuits um, and are in negotiations right now about, you know, stopping the ex exhumation of their ancestors uh, for a border wall. Uh, the kind of um, cultural and religious systems and traditions that are being undermined right now by putting up a wall where none has ever existed on borders, cutting people off from each other, families from each other. That's certainly the case at Don Autumn and their autumn people in Sonora, Mexico. For the Kumeyaay people, they have a, a lawsuit. These uh, Anwar, uh, the Gwich'in uh, porcupine caribou herd is under great threat. The Gwich'in people are under great threat. Anwar itself, the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge is uh, under attack again, still uh, threatened with, with mining, with digging Oak Flat is being threatened right now physically with one of the world's largest copper mines. It, this is um, there are hundreds and hundreds of sacred places that are under this kind of attack, known, many of them protect, already protected, supposedly in protected status. Uh, and, and we really need to have people help us with that we need many more scientists who really understand the consequences of moving and, and changing a certain kind of EPA regulation. Um, we need people who can help find protections where none appear to exist to us or ways of stopping the violations of the protections that do exist how do we how do we what do we do with an administration that is lawless and that thinks that everything that doesn't already have an oil well or a gold mine on it or a copper mine um, should and can be exploited. That's 
that's a tall order. So we need people in the areas who will help us educate friends and neighbors about these problems and how they're everyone's problems. They're not just Native people's problems. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if we're going to get through all of these. Are you, how are you feeling? Can I just do a check in with you? Because I, I don't get to look at you um, and perceive you uh, other than through your voice. How are you feeling? <laughs> You, I'm fine. Okay. It, it's up to you. I, I, I worry about everyone's ears. <laughs> so. yeah, well, I, I, we may, I, just to those who've posed questions, we may not get to each and every one. And if we don't, I apologize. Um, but um, one other question that I, it, I think it bears asking, it, although you dealt with this in, in the lawsuit, but, and it goes to the in-group, out-group. It, go, it goes really to some of the stories you started to tell at the very beginning about the University of Oklahoma and the in-group, out-group use of some of this terminology. So Red Mesa High School in Arizona uses the name that the Washington football team used until very recently. And the question is, should it still be used um, by Navajo or, or other tr tribal members, or, or do you believe that schools like Red Mesa should change their name as well? Well, I think there's no reason to keep it. Uh, these are not, uh, I understand the wish to do so, the defiance of authority saying, ha ha, we're the Indians, we can do anything we want uh, because it's just making fun of ourselves and we can do that. Well, yeah, there's, there's that argument. The other thing is that each team has, a, has an opponent and their fans and their team are supposed, their, it's their job to make your people feel as bad about your name and the way you are, the way you look, the way your tail wags or whatever it is that's being emphasized about you and your mascot as they can, and they do. And what often happens is, and this is repeated over and over again, no matter what part of the country you're in, uh, at White Mountain Apache in Arizona, one time the, the Apache basketball team was playing and others started mocking them and then the, the mocking about the game intensified into stereotypes about all sorts of other things that are based on just mythology. Um, yeah, you guys never pay taxes. So, I mean, what that has to do with winning a game, I mean, it's not true. We pay a lot of taxes. Uh, but what that has to do with the basketball game, I'm not quite sure, but it always devolves into that kind of set, that set of remarks about whatever the local hot points are about land or water, minerals, names, yeah. uh, all of that, it, that, that happens. And so I don't think it's an enough just to say self-identification is enough of a justification. Uh, it started, it, you know, these boarding schools started the process of uh, adding Indians to the, the realm of, of um, mascots that were wild animals. And so what the modern day and just, there are just a few, there aren't many uh, native schools that are doing the same thing. Um, they're just carrying out a racist agenda. I, why carry that out against yourself? I understand the distinction and there is a distinction to be made in the same way that the slants can be the slants and not be an anti-Asian band. Um, but, but how embarrassing 
So I, I just don't think that uh, just because I'm a woman, I would um, not allow other people to call me uh, terrible things that people say about women, ter terrible names that we get called, that why would I start a band or a team called one of those names? And why would I keep one? So I applaud everyone who's changing them. And I, I just think it's a very weak argument to say, yeah, we can do whatever we want. Because this is something the, the white people don't get to get do, but we do because we're Indians. I don't get that. I understand it, but I don't get it. Fair enough. Um, I, there are a series of questions that move beyond the sort of information justice aspect that, that Peter set up. Um, and, and I do want to get to those, but there's one other, and this, this, is a poli this goes to an ongoing policy conversation at the international law level. Um, and it's whether, um, whether within the system of rights for around information and exclusive rights around information. Um, there, you know, in the World Intellectual Property Organization, there's been a conversation going on for more than a decade about whether we need a treaty to recognize collective rights in what are sometimes called traditional knowledge, tradi traditional cultural expression. So these could be prayers, stories, other kinds of intangible uh, information that has some sacred quality to it, um, and should should that sacred quality be recognized in law in a way in which there's some exclusive right uh, that that could be used at least by the group against those outside the group? There's always a challenge with this concept about who gets to define the right and exercise the right. But within this international conversation. Uh, a lot of focus is placed on native traditional knowledge and, and traditional cultural expression as the U.S.'s kind of, uh, you know, interest in, 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 in having this conversation. So, and I'd be curious to know within, in the way you think about the priorities, the policy priorities, and in terms of the way you think about the legal system, is this a priority or if not, why not? Well, so much of intellectual property has been, property law seems to have been developed it, with, a, with the goal in mind of separating Native peoples from their traditional medicines, from their traditional places, from their traditional ideas and any stuff they make. So all of it that depends on the same system, just tweaking the same system, it seems like you're still left with the, the, the same issue that uh, you have people from long ago who put their names on arrowroot and made Bayer aspirin and they have too much invested in that to allow for any acknowledgement of the traditional rights, collective rights of native peoples. And that's what you see going on in the Amazon right now, what, what's gone on for ever in the, in the rest of this red quarter of mother earth it's um, we we tried to do that in in the repatriation uh, law NAGPRA by changing the lexicon um, and creating the category of cultural patrimony. Um, 
what what I would like to see is just the uh, native peoples, native nations issuing cultural declarations of cultural rights and saying, this is ours. This is the way we say it. We don't want this name used uh, for the local bar and grill. Um, we want acknowledgement that this is ours. This is our oral history. This is our, our, our. Um, the Apache Nation, all the, the Apache bands and tribes did this already in the early 90s for the purpose of repatriation because they were being given the runaround at every holding repository. They would say, well, we would be happy to return this, but we don't know if it's, if this is San Carlos or if it's White Mountain Apache. And they would do the same thing with the Pueblos. We don't know if this is Acoma or Laguna. Well, we have a solution for that, which is just to give it to us and we'll figure that part out. So that's in effect what the Apaches said was, here is our declaration of this, 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 and this. And um, if you can't draw a distinction between us, uh, repatriate it and we will parcel it out. We'll draw those distinctions. Um, the, I mean, that the difference between Laguna and Acoma Pueblo was, it was a very real one raised by the head of the Peabody at Harvard and saying we, we just have to list it at, at all of the items under that category we have to list as unidentifiable because we don't know. Well, they're unidentifiable because you don't know how to identify them. But if you give them to the Laguna and Acoma peoples who live across the street from each other, <laughs> we bet they can figure it out. So it, it, doing that, um, that the whole point of the cultural patrimony category is the recognition of collective rights and to get around this notion that um, museums and other holding repositories have good title or title at all because they have paper. When in fact, they paid no, uh, they, they've not respected or recognized the collective rights of the people who own these things and have responsibility to these things and rights to these things uh, collectively. And that they cannot be alienated by any one person or one part of the group of that collective unit. So. The, the key to, I think, getting into this, this area of collective rights is, is in that cultural patrimony category, which museums are terrified of because they don't get to be the judge of what is collective, what is a collective right, what is a collective property. You just made my job. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, no, I just, uh, we, we were um, you know, going through, you know, sometimes if you want to make new law, you have to make up uh, new terms or you just use different terms. Uh, and we wouldn't use the terms of disrespect or inexactitude uh, for human remains, we use the term human remains instead of specimen, bones, um, skeletons, skeletal material, uh, it, and use funerary objects for grave goods. Grave goods really, it's pirate talk. I mean, only pirates talk about grave goods. 
and scientists in dealing with the uh, with our long ago people or our our yesterday people. Uh, so we we just change the the terminology from the the known to the different and and more respectful that a sacred object is a sacred object and um, we were pretty successful and and that has helped a lot so sometimes you learn a lot by by just agreeing on new new ways of saying it and um, and wh agree on why prior ways of, of describing it or saying it uh, don't work. And also trying not to define things. Uh, some things you really don't want to define because by the definition you limit. Uh, the sacred is one of those things. You don't want a definition of the sacred. Um, you don't want a limitation on the sacred. It, it just makes no sense. And is not required of anyone else. So I would just use those cautions. Uh, it, but it's an area that certainly needs revamping and not so much just bringing Native people into the same process that, that get you a trademark for so many years or a copyright for so many years and then agreement that that thereafter it's in the public domain. I mean, that's the least desirable, I think, of everything, uh, of all the, the possibilities. That, but this self-declaration, uh, I think, is the key, and, and disallowing for the judgment of other people who are outside the knowledge base of the traditional knowledge you're, trying, you're declaring from. That's that's quite interesting. I I don't partake in that conversation too deeply, but enough to know that that's a that's fairly new. And thank you for that. That's that's quite interesting. Um, I it was very helpful as a in, in my role because you anticipated, and I believe I'm going to count it as an answer to two of the questions about some of the shortcomings of Nagpra that need mm -hmm. fixing. So I'm gonna, the last theme, uh, there are two questions, and I think this is our last one, is sort of um, it, your advice, your lessons learned um, for, the, for Black Lives Matter and the moment in, in, in that part of the racial reckoning that's happening in the country. Um, and, you know, whether it's about the case for reparations for, uh, Black people who are descended from slaves or Black people otherwise. Uh, but just in general, um, you know, there was that very inspiring article in the Washington Post about your relationship with Congressman John Lewis and his support for for your work. And and so this, uh, you know, the, when we think of allies and we think of coalitions, um, you know, you've already, you've already had that. It's part of your history. It's part of, of the work you've done. And so with that history in mind and, and looking forward, you know, to the extent that as someone who's focused on racial justice, but cultural justice as well, what advice, if anything, would you give to these young folks in the Black Lives Matter movement and their allies about dealing with those, that set of issues? Well, not to give up the, the quest for reparations because it's only around that topic that you have change in the in the systems that need to be changed it's only when you introduce the prospect of of large amounts of money being spent to address a problem do you get people who become very creative at um, addressing the problem. And to not despair about not having a voice. I mean, if anything has, has 
if any lesson has been laid out there for anyone to learn uh, by Black Lives Matter, by the families of all the people who have been killed, um, it's that your voice matters, that your true voice and collective voice matters, and that I was very interested in what Mayor Bowser did, DC Mayor Bowser did with probably just a handful of, of uh, advisors <clears throat> in coming up with the street painting, the asphalt painting that they called a mural. So it's protected art, artistic freedom, and the renaming of the street or several streets was Black Lives Matter Plaza. And those huge yellow letters that say Black Lives Matter. And then there was the next morning, someone had written on one of the big yellow letters that now, Mayor, this is just performative and what are you going to do now? Which was really interesting because it, Black Lives Matter is, is a performative entity. I mean, it's, it, it's decentralized and have each of its pods, each of its local organizations is run by people who are performance artists, actors, writers who are who are creative people which is one reason it's so successful that the people are are wordsmiths and they're uh they do things that are eye-catching and so the it, it it was interesting that it was sort of a comment made by what purported to be an ally of the the Black Lives Matter movement on the performative nature of Muriel Bowser's huge step forward <laughs> that could be seen from, the letters could be seen from space and certainly from the White House next door, which was the whole point of it, that uh, it was a reminder that the streets still belong to the District of Columbia and its people, most of whom are Black and Black Lives Matter. This was a powerful message. And I thought, I think one of the, the great um, lessons is, is in style and performance. And it doesn't mean that you're foregoing the um, the root problem uh, uh, in reforming a justice system, it means that you're capturing the attention of people in a way that that speaks to their hearts and to their uh, to their minds very quickly. Um, and it's embedded, it's like music. Uh, it, it just speaks to a different part of the brain than argument, than protest, then it, there's a, it's a different way of receiving information and to never discount the importance of the creative people in the leadership and in the advisorship and the allyship, uh, as part of, of the general movement because 
that's going to capture the spirit of the people to get you to the actual nitty gritty work of figuring out what comes after this comma saying notwithstanding any other provision of law. That's the, it, so I, I think it, uh, um, people of all sorts, uh, with all sorts of skills, should take heart in this time and the lessons of this particular movement, uh, which of course is not just about black people, it's about everyone. And it's about everyone's justice system. And the, the faster we can do something to address the murder of Breonna Taylor while she was asleep and in her nightgown and taking six bullets in her own house, the better off we'll be as peoples and as a society. We have to get there. We really have to get there. And if your way of getting there is to be in, in the street, that's one way. If it's to write something, do that. If it's to just argue the points with your relatives, do that. But it's time for everyone to do something. There, in years and years ago, there was a, uh, a, a woman in California in the women's rights movement in the 60s who would say, in order for there to be a movement, everyone's got to move and I'll support anything that's off its ass. And I always liked that. It was, um, that's the time we're in right now. Just think of the most respectful way to address these dangerous, vile subjects and the examples of them. And how do we do that in a way that makes it possible for us to continue living on the same planet with each other? Well, what a beautiful, what a beautiful uh, way to end. And, and absolutely couldn't agree more. Uh, thank you for that. Um, so I think that brings us to the end of the question and answer session. And there's only one more piece of business. Uh, thank you for all of your time and, and your effort uh, with this. Um, I'm going to turn the mic back over to uh, Peter, um, it, because it is our tradition, of course, to, to give a gift uh, in return for all, all that you've uh, given to us. And, and Peter will will be uh, is is the source and will bestow virtually <laughs> the gift uh so peter please take it away thank you professor carol <laughs> meredith um can we have the the the, the slide please great uh, so it, it, mike is right this is my my privilege and always my pleasure to try to think of something that's ungeneric and, and appropriate for, for each of our distinguished speakers. And often it's an old book because somehow to me, old books seem like a ve vessels of, of significance uh, even beyond their contents. Among the, the greatest accomplishments of the, the activists of, 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 of your generation, Suzanne, has been the progress you've made toward recovering the old idea of a legal order in which federal and state authorities recognize the independent and co-equal sovereignty of, of Native peoples. One of the, one of the, the powerful messages of the the nation to nation exhibit that I described earlier that all of you should go and see before it closes is that this was the original understanding 
of the relationship between native peoples and the colonial federal government, which was then lost over time and which therefore is capable of being recovered. It's a tremendous accomplishment and the fact that it isn't a, a full accomplished, that the, the, it isn't fully accomplished yet is, is doesn't take anything away from its, its significance. It's also true that others contributed to this development and among those was the, the late Felix S. Cohn. In the legal academy, we, we probably know him best as a, a legal philosopher and a, a pioneer of legal realism. But he had another, ultimately perhaps even more significant career. He, along with his, his wife, anthropologist and, and economist Lucy Kramer Cohen, they were really the, the, the prime architects of the so-called Indian New Deal, which in the, the late 30s and 1940s began the process of restoring meaningful autonomy to tribal governments and their citizens. Uh, Cohen did that primarily while he was in charge of, of, of Indian law issues in the U.S. Department of the Interior Office of the Solicitor. And, and one of the projects that, that he undertook to help realize this vision was the, the creation and, and, and publication of an extremely influential handbook of federal Indian law, which is still one of the most widely cited documents in the field and, and was, was, has been very recently and, 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 and powerfully cited as authority in Supreme Court jurisprudence. There were several editions of that book during Cohen's time in the Interior Solicitor's Office. And we found a copy of the fourth edition from 1945, which was the final edition that Cohen himself saw through the press before he left government. And it's a real copy, not a virtual copy. It's, <laughs> it's a pretty nice copy. It's, it, it turns out from the markings that you can tell that it was formerly actually in the, Depar in the, in the law library of the Department of the Interior. And it will be on its way shortly to you with our our profound thanks for an extraordinary evening. Oh, thank you, Peter. That it, it's a wonderful, wonderful gift, and it means so much to me, especially as an alum of Felix Cohen's law firm, Fried Frank Harris Schwarber Campbellman, as it was when I was there. Uh, however, briefly, before I went to the National Congress of American Indians. Uh, well, I was I was thrilled to find it, and I'm I'm, I'm glad that it's it's meaningful to you. Well, thank you. I I so appreciate this, and um, and the use of your name. <laughs> <laughs> Michael. Yeah. So uh, there there's some wonderful things about being able to meet virtually, and the fact that we had such a br international group all together uh, is, is one of the wonderful things that this technology allows. But one of the downsides is that we don't get to be together socially and, and casually at the end of an event. And it's very hard to say goodbye, <laughs> uh, but it, it does seem as if that time has arrived. And, and um, thank you for all of the folks who stayed with us. Um, I, we did get some private messages of people who are in different time zones who have to go to meetings and the sort, and we fully understand. Uh, but this has really been extraordinary and very special um, on behalf of the program on information justice and intellectual property, all of my colleagues, I want to thank you for your attention and time. I want to thank Suzanne again for what really a very memorable, remarkable uh, talk and journey, really. Um, and and we will we will keep paying attention. We will keep 
we will stay off our rear ends and keep moving. <laughs> and with that thought, <laughs> I believe uh, we can now uh, call this to a close. Thank you all so much. Nice. You're right.